receptors sensitive to targeted therapies such as lymphoma, small cell lung cancer, non-small cell lung cancer with driver mutations may only require a single aspiration, which will temporarily relieve dyspnea until systemic oncologic treatment takes effect. However, there are no randomized controlled studies on this topic. The accumulation of some chemotherapeutic agent into the Andrein pleural space may result in delayed clearance and increased toxicity. And as demonstrated in this recent study of 127 malignant pleural effusion patients due to lung cancer with oncogenic mutations, early fluid control measures, pleural disease or IPC, have benefits independent of anti-cancer therapies. Early control of the pleural space, in addition to targeted therapy as compared to targeted therapy alone, significantly reduce the subsequent need for MPE ray intervention, 23% versus 54%. And similar benefits from MPE control measures were found in 34 patients with no targetable mutations receiving systemic anti-cancer therapy. 0% versus 52%. Moreover, this recent study demonstrates that patients with actionable mutation who receive targeted treatment have a similar risk of MPE recurrence, 64%, when compared with patients without mutation, 58%, and therefore would benefit from a similar definitive management approach to MPE. Again, in this study, a larger pleural effusion size was associated with an increased risk of fluid recurrence. ATA's guidelines suggest large volume ultrasound guided thoracentesis in symptomatic malignant pleural effusions if it is uncertain whether the patient's symptoms are related to the effusion or to assess lung re-expansion if pleural disease is contemplated. But guidelines acknowledge that this step may not be necessary if the patient's dyspnea is known to be attributable to the MPE and we plan to manage MPE with an IPC, which is our current approach as I will detail later. In our unit, we perform an initial therapeutic thoracentesis only in symptomatic MPE patients with an expected survival of less than one month for whom no more than two aspirations are anticipated. Otherwise, an IPC would be an acceptable option. But how should we perform a therapeutic thoracentesis? Using manual aspiration, as shown on the right, gravity drainage, or vacuum drainage, as shown on the left. And to answer this question, I will show you a couple of studies. The Gravitas study randomized 142 symptomatic patients with pleural effusions to gravity drainage or manual aspiration with a syringe. The primary outcome of overall procedural chest discomfort measured by BAS five minutes post procedure did not differ between groups, but the procedure duration was significantly longer in the gravity arm. 7.4 minutes versus 4.6 minutes. In other words, active manual aspiration and gravity drainage were both safe and resulted in comparable levels of procedural comfort and Disney improvement, but active aspiration saved time. And the second study was a retrospective study including more than 7,200 patients who underwent more than 10,000 for a synthesis procedure using suction through vacuum bottles. Pleural fluid, more than 1.5 liter was removed in about 20% of the procedures. And thoracentesis was stopped due to chest discomfort in 39%, complete drainage of fluid in 37%, and persistent cough in 13% of the cases. Pneumothorax and uh, Re-expansion pulmonary edema were very rare conditions, 0.28 and 0.08% respectively. So according to this study, therapeutic thoracentesis using suction is also safe 
even with large volumes. And this is currently our preference. However, I understand that this is a matter of taste and you may prefer manual aspiration or gravity suction. Periodesis is defined as parietal visceral pleural adhesion with obliteration of the pleural space, resulting in sustained resolution of the pleural effusion. It can be achieved chemically by the installation of a periodesis agent or mechanically by surgical abrasion or pleurectomy. Tal is the most widely used periodesis agent, as you know. It can be administered into the pleural space, either suspended in saline, talc slurry, or insufflated or aerosolized at the time of thoracoscopy, talpogrash, as seen in this video. Various chemical agents have been used for decades to achieve periodesis. This network meta-analysis of 25 randomized controlled trials reported 21 intrapleural interventions for adults with symptomatic MPE. On the author estimated the rank of each intervention effectiveness. That is, they ranked the agents according to their pleurodesis success rate. And obviously the less effective agent was placebo, ranked 21. Whereas thoracoscopic mechanical pleurodesis rank among the most effective, but with a wide 95% confidence interval. And for this reason, Talpodrash and Talc Slurry, which rank three and five respectively, were considered to be the most effective according to the narrow 95% confidence interval. So we may accept that Tal is for the moment the best pleurodesis agent available. But what is the most effective method of delivering Tal into the plural space? Slurry or podrash? This has been recently answered by the TAPS trial. And the TAPS trial evenly randomized 330 patients with malignant pleural effusion to receive either four grams of tal podrash at thoracoscopy or a bedside chest drain and four grams of tal slurry. Patients with trap lung obviously were excluded. And the primary outcome, failure rates at three months of randomization was not a statistically different between the two arms with 22% podrash patient needing another intervention compared with 24% in the slurry group. Failure rates at six months were nearly 30% in both groups. So there is no benefit of podrash over slurry in terms of pure disease success. So the next question is, if we choose bedside tal slurry pleurodesis, does chest tube size influence pleurodesis success? And this was addressed in the time one trial. The time one trial randomized 320 patients requiring tal pleurodesis to either 24 French or 12 French chest tubes and to opiate or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs analgesic regimens for pain control. It should be remembered that avoidance of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs has been traditionally suggested because theoretically, this drug may suppress the acute inflammation caused by pleural disease agents, which is irrational for pleural synthesis. In this trial, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs were shown to be non-inferior to opioids in terms of pleurodesis success. And so we can use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs as liberally as required during pleurodesis. And concerning chest tube size, a marginally superior success rate of pleurodesis in the large drain group, 24 French, was shown as compared with the 12 French group at three months, 76 versus 70%. However, a recent meta-analysis of four randomized controlled trials, including the time one, indicates that small bore chest tubes are equivalent to large bore tubes in terms of pleurodesis efficacy. In any case, it would be wise to use chest tube of, of at least 14, 16 French for pleurodesis on the basis of the time one trial. Can we always perform pleurodesis? Obviously no. An incomplete land expansion after fluid drainage 
which usually result from malignant invasion of the visceral pleura, is a relative contraindication to pleurodesis, particularly if there is less than 50% of parietal visceral pleural opposition. These cases can, more, can be more effectively uh, managed, obviously, with uh, IPCs. Another relative contraindication to performing pleurodesis procedures is an incompletely drained space due to multiseptated or multiloculated effusions, which reduces the likelihood of pleurodesis success. How should then multiseptated effusion requiring pleurodesis be managed? So let's have a look to the time three trial. In the time three trial, randomized 71 patients with non-draining septated malignant pleural effusions were allocated to receive either intrapleural urokinase or placebo followed by tal slurry pleurodesis after 24 hours. Urokinase installation reduced the efficient size of chest radiograph, but there were no differences in Disney scores over the first month or pleurodesis failure rates one year after the randomization between the two groups. 37% failure for urokinase group and 32% failure for placebo group. So therefore the study did not support a role for routine intrapleural fibrinolytic therapy prior to pleurodesis in patients with multiseptated malignant pleural effusions. But tal pleurodesis has a number of limitations. First, at least 30% of patients with malignant pleural effusion will have non-expansible lungs and therefore they will not be candidates for pleurodesis. Second, about 15% of patients with MPE develop symptomatic loculations that increase the probability of pleurodesis failure. Third, pleurodesis is not successful in about one third of patients. Fourth, when attempted pleurodesis fails, the resultant localized effusion may be difficult to manage. Fifth, pleurodesis requires admission to hospital for several days. And finally, tal pleurodesis is associated with a number of adverse events. It produces pain in nearly 70% of the cases, fever in half of the cases, and even acute respiratory distress syndrome. And you know that to avoid this latter complication, graded or large particle tal must be used. So bear in mind these limitations, the advent of the IPC presents an alternative that challenges the traditional role of pleurodesis. IPC is a fenestrated 15.5 uh, silicon catheter, which is tunneled subcutaneously to prevent dislodgement and infection. A polyester cuff acts as a barrier to infection and promotes addition to the subcutaneous tissue to secure the catheter in place. And drainage of the fluid is performed by connecting the external one-way valve to a vacuum bottle, as can be seen in this slide. So IPC is inserted uh, in an ambulatory or the AK sitting, thus minimizing hospitalization. And regular intermittent fluid drainage is performed at home by the patient or the family members or in the community sitting. Mainly indicated initially when pleurodesis has failed or is contraindicated, for example, in patients with trapped lungs, IPC has become now a first line definitive management for malignant pleural effusion in place of pleurodesis. So the first question is, are IPCs better than tal pleurodesis for relieving symptoms in patients with malignant pleural effusions? Two studies comparing IPC with tal slurry demonstrated comparable breathlessness control between intervention. And these studies were called TIME2 and AMPLE. In the TIME2 trial, 106 patients receive either a chest drain and talc slurry or an IPC with drainage three times weekly with the primary outcome being dyspnea relief over the first 42 days, six weeks after enrollment. An IPC reduced 
Sorry, I don't know. I have some problem with the slides. Okay. IPC reduced dyspnea and chest pain, which is now represented here, during the initial six weeks to a level similar to Talpero disease. Those secondary analyses demonstrated a statistically significant improvement in dyspnea in the IPC group at six months compared with the tal Slurry group. The AMPLE study reported a statistically significant reduction in the number of days spent in hospital until one year or death of the patient among patients randomized to receive an IPC with symptom-guided drainage compared with those undergoing chest drain and tal pyrodesis, 10 versus 12 days. Obviously a small difference of uncertain clinical significance. But summing up the two previous studies, time to an ample, about 22% of patients in the TAL group required further invasive pleural interventions compared to only 5% in the IPC group. On the other hand, there were more non-serious complications noted in the IPC arm. So IPC reduces the need for hospitalization, reduced the need for further peripheral procedures, but at the expense of more non-serious adverse events. In our initial experience with 336 IPC procedures, IPC removal secondary to autopleurodesis or spontaneous pleurodesis was achieved in about 50% of the patients after a median time of 50 days. So we use the rule 50-50, 50% of autopleurodesis in 50 days. An autopleurodesis is defined as pleurodesis that occurs by simply having an IPC in situ without the installation of a chemical esclerosa into the pleural space. Note that IPC related pleural infection was reported to take place in 7% of malignant pleural effusion. Importantly, the risk of IPC related infection does not appear to be increased by antineoplastic therapy use or an immunocompromised state. So IPC is indicated for palliation of malignant pleural effusion, regardless of plan for anti-cancer therapy. Trapped lungs were detected in one third of the cases in line with previous literature. And once the IPC was removed, further pleural procedures were necessary in 8% of the cases. But for some patients, not only is symptom palliation an important goal, but so also is IPC removal. In addition, the less time the IPC is in place, the lower the cost and potential complications. The ideal IPC drainage schedule is currently unknown. IPC can be drained by either of two approaches. Symptom-based drainage, usually two or three times per week, or aggressively with daily drainage. Which of these better achieve autopleurodesis rates have been addressed in the ASAP and the AMPLE to trials. In the ASAP trial, 149 patients were randomized to either a daily drainage of pleural fluid via an IPC or a standard drainage every other day drainage. The primary outcome was the incidence of autopleurodesis. An autopleurodesis was greater in the aggressive arm than the standard drainage arm, 47% versus 24% approximately. In addition, the median time to autopleurodesis was shorter in the aggressive arm, 54 days, as compared to the standard arm, 90 days. The AMPLE2 trial showed that there was no difference in mean daily breathlessness scores between 43 patients subjected to aggressive daily IPC drainage and 44 whose IPC were only trained when they had symptoms. As in the uh, sub-trial, more patients in the aggressive drainage group achieve spontaneous pleurodesis than those in the symptom-guided group at two months, 37.2 versus 11.4%. Another approach to reduce time the IPC is in place is administer a pleurodesis agent through the catheter as performed in the IPC plus trial. The IPC plus trial tested the hypothesis that four grams of TAL administered via the IPC 
It's more effective at inducing pleurodesis than the use of an IPC alone, with a regimen of at least two drainages weekly for both groups. Successful pleurodesis at day 35 was achieved in 43% of patients who receive talc compared to a 23% autopleurodesis rate in the placebo group. So talc can be delivered efficaciously via an IPC to all patients with malignant pleural effusions. In the future, accelerated autopleurodesis regimens will be explored. And there are exciting possibilities with drug eluting catheters, including a silver nitrate coated IPC that slowly eludes the pleurodesis agent over time. This is called the shift trial. IPC talpleurodesis is currently being compared to thoracoscopic and bedside talpleurodesis in the AMPLE 3 and OPTIMUM trials, respectively. And the tactic trial will evaluate the combination of thoracoscopic talpudrash and IPC against thoracoscopic talpudrash alone. Obviously, the ultimate aim of malignant pleural effusion management should be the turning off of pleural fluid formation. But to achieve that, we will need to expand our very limited knowledge of the pathobiology of malignant pleural effusion formation. This algorithm summarizes 2018 ATS recommendation for managing malignant pleural effusions. An initial therapeutic thoracentesis will provide insight into the effect of effusion on dyspnea and provide information about the system of a trapped lung. For unexpandable lungs, the option is IPC, and for expandable ones, the patient should choose between IPC or talprodesis. But our approach is much simpler. Patients with large symptomatic malignant pleural effusion usually go directly to IPC unless they are moribund. So we always plan to manage MPE with an IPC for two reasons. Number one, there is no doubt that effusions occupying half or more of the hemithorax on a chest ray or four or more intercostal spaces on ultrasound or being large enough to be accessible at the mid-axillary line cause shortness of breath. No doubt, a therapeutic aspiration is not needed to confer this, which would lead to a postponement of a necessary definitive procedure. And reason number two, using this approach, an expandable lungs are not a concern because an IPC is the therapeutic option in these cases as well. In patients for whom IPC is important, IPC removal, aggressive daily drainage are also favor in conjunction maybe with tal installation to shorten the time in which the IPC is in place. So some key points. Number one, number one consider repeated therapeutic aspiration if expected survival is less than one month and you anticipate a slow reaccumulation of fluid. Number two, early definitive pleural intervention should be offered to all symptomatic malignant pleural effusion patients, regardless of tumor type, whether it is highly chemosensitive cancer or a targetable tumor, and regardless of treatment plan. Number three, TAL is the most effective agent available for pleural disease and can be administered as a slurry through a chest tube or podrash through a thoracoscope with equal efficacy. Number four, IPC is as effective as TAL pleurodesis as relieving symptoms and is associated with reduced time in hospital, reduced need for further procedure, although it produces more non-serious adverse events. And finally, daily drainage regimens and installation of TAL through IPCs expedite catheter removal. So thank you very much for your attention. I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Professor Paul Sell. Mm -hmm. It was very comprehensive, very clear uh, presentation. Now we can take questions and comments. 
I will check. Is there any? I have a question. Please. Uh, I saw a, a catheter uh, produced by uh, Philip Astol um, from pleura to bladder. Yes. Uh, uh, what do you think about that? Uh, could it be a separated tumor uh, from pleura to bladder, for example, mesothelioma? Well, I, uh, I know this, uh, this study, but I think it's a very complicated way to solve a pleural effusion. If you drain the pleural fluid, the pleural fluid to the urine, you will be uh, the patient urinating uh, constantly. So I don't think this is a good idea. The study is, uh, is performed in pig, and obviously it's a, it, they, they demonstrated it's a feasible, but I don't think it will achieve some practical application in humans. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There is another one question from Professor Metintash. Thank you very much for this comprehensive lecture. We tried to use autolog blood against talc for malignant pleural effusion. The results are nearly the same. There is no important difference. What do you think about autological blood for pleurodiasis in malignant case, Professor Forsa? Well, um, sometimes th there are some uh, studies, usually small studies using blood to, as an agent to pleurodiasis. We don't have experience using blood. Uh, sometimes thoracic surgeons have used, have used blood to close uh, bronchopleural fistula, mainly to, to close this uh, situation. But I don't have personal experience. And according to the meta-analysis, uh, it's not apparently uh, a top uh, agent to produce pleurodesis. Okay, thank you very much. There is another question. Do you happen to be following patients at catheter thoracostomy as outpatient, or do the, do they stay at the hospital till the catheter ended? No, we always perform IPC uh, as an outpatient uh, mm -hmm. situation. I mean, if the patient is hospitalized for all the reason and they have a large pleural effusion, obviously we perform at this time during mm -hmm. hospitalization. But we don't need the patient be hospitalized to perform this. Usually, the procedure takes about 20, 30 minutes in total. So it's oh, very perfect. easy. The patient go, go home without problems. Yeah. IPC is the outpatient procedure mainly. Yes. Yeah. It's mainly outpatients. Another question. In which situations that patients have a benign pleural effusion need IPC? Sorry, sorry. Would you repeat? Again, huh? in which situations at patients have a benign pleural effusion need uh, IPC. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, usually we perform IPC procedures in patients with uh, resistant heart failure. For example, patients with chronic heart failure who are not responding correctly to diuretics or have adverse events to diuretics. It's the main indication because we, we have a lot of patients with heart failure. Uh -huh. Sometimes we put uh, IPCs in patients with hepatic hydrothorax. This is more controversial because if the patient is in a transplantation list, it's not a good idea because if the IPC becomes infected, this patient will be out of the list. So we try uh -huh. to avoid IPCs in, in liver cirrhosis, but sometimes if the patient is not a candidate for TIPS, or not a candidate for transplantation, and they have recurrent pleural fluid, sometimes we put an IPC. And uh, very rarely we have some patient, for example, with uh, pleural effusion after coronary artery bypass surgery mm -hmm. who are resistant to uh, several thoracentesis who may need uh, an IPC. Okay, another question. Your last flow chart does not consist the video thoracoscopic approach to any of the pleural effusion, which I totally agree with. However, 